everybody. We are here talking about writing, publishing, reading, and I'm feeling a little spicy today, Kaylee. I'm not going to lie. I have been traveling for the past two weeks, so my internal rage is probably at an all-time high. <laughs> yes, I have probably been on the other end myself, and you've been just sitting back and getting a lot of it from work. So. <laughs> I'm feeling a little chill today. So oh, good. It works out real well. well. We'll balance. I am Annie, and I'm here with Kaylee. How are you doing, girl? I'm great, Annie. I have a couple days off work. Good. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a dream. Absurd. It's really <laughs> absurd. I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle it anyway. So how are, how are you other than super glad to not be on a train anymore? Oh, my God. Fam, listen, I love the train. I enjoy the train so much more than flying. Mm -hmm. The leg room alone Mm -hmm. is worth the cost of admission. The fact that you can sleep, the fact that you can eat whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. Look, I'm happy about trains existing and I love them. But when you spend, I think, across the past two weeks, I've spent maybe 72 hours total on trains. You get a little sleepy internally, emotionally (laughs) of trains. Yeah. But anyways, highly recommend if you are someone who hates flying, if you hate checking your bags, if you hate not being able to bring your own food, if you hate not having leg room, highly recommend a train. But if you are going to travel for more than a few weeks, there's there's really no good option. Even a car would suck. So <laughs> just don't travel. Just <laughs> stay, stay with, home. Stay, with, stay home. <laughs> don't go anywhere. This is both my pandemic advice and my travel advice. <laughs> If you want to travel, don't. Yeah. If you want to go see people, no. Those people are dead to you now. Just don't (laughs) don't go see them. It's fine. You didn't love them anyway. Yeah. Who needs friends or family, honestly? This is getting dark, so I'm going to (laughs) stop. All right, Kaylee, there's been a crap ton happening. So over the past two weeks, we have had an update on one of our long running legal cases that we have been following. This most recent one was with Amazon.com. If you searched Amazon for, I think, COVID-19 and vaccine in the book section, you got a lot of misinformation that had come up, things that are proven to be false. And Senator Elizabeth Warren contacted Amazon.com and said, hey, let's check this out and maybe this shouldn't be the way that it is. And Amazon has now responded. Actually, Amazon has not responded. The authors of the book that Warren specifically called out responded. They're suing for defamation, which is very strange because it seems like the crux of their argument is not actually defamation. It's like a freedom of speech thing. Yeah. And she wasn't saying that it's illegal for them to be there. She was just saying maybe the put algorithm. a warning. It legitimately said yeah. the algorithm, just can we examine it, why it's prompting proven misinformation first? Is this book categorized correctly? And then I think, it, can we please add a warning? I mean, yes, Warren is a government official. So her asking is technically a government act. And the First Amendment is covering government not allowed to infringe on people's freedom of speech. That is accurate. We'll see how this goes. Honestly, my guess is that Amazon will probably add warnings to misinformation, which they've been struggling against. I wonder how this will shake out. Yeah, I'll be very interested to see the legal arguments because I don't think that anything in Warren's letter or notice really constitutes her asking them to not publish it. Mm -hmm. It's just, hey, are you promoting this correctly? And then are you warning the consumers responsibly, essentially? So I will also be very interested in the unfolding legal drama. We'll see how it goes and we will keep you updated here at the Ink Sync. In other news, if you feel like you are hearing about ransomware attacks every other day. Oh my God. Guess what? You are. Yeah, it still it happens every other day pretty much. And probably in a, in a field you're rel- that's relevant to your interests. Yep, and it turns out relevant to our interest is Diamond Publishing. And when we say publishing here, we mean printer. Diamond is a comic book printer and distributor. And they were hit with a ransomware attack. The big news came through on a lot of nerd sites saying, hey, your comics for the next month or so might be delayed because Diamond Comics was hit with a ransomware attack. If you were thinking, Diamond Comics, the initials of that are DC. Is that DC Comics? No. <laughs> it's Diamond Comics. Let's be very, actually, just to be very clear. Well spotted, but no. <laughs> That's stupid. Like, huh? like, why of all industries? Why this? Per- like, we're already, guys, it's already having trouble. Let's be clear. You're really punching down. Not not really the, the prime target to get a lot of money, honestly. Yeah. <sighs> Poor comics. <laughs> They're doing their best. They're doing their best. (laughs) It's not their fault. I feel like there must end up being some kind of 
something to stop all these ransomware attacks. I mean, it was out of hand to begin with, but it's getting more out of hand than it was. It's getting worse, it feels. Maybe it's it's just because it's more in the news, but... Well, I think that's maybe, but I do legitimately think that people are just realizing how easy it is to social engineer somebody to to download links. And that's the answer. And on top of a supply chain shortage, I mean, just... Just making it worse. Horrible. I feel really bad. What can you do? Don't open emails. (laughs) Guys... (laughs) Just do some research. Seriously, if it's... You don't know the sender. If it yeah. seems like a sus link, maybe don't click on it. Report and phishing. Always. Change your passwords. Regularly. Shop local. This is going to be affecting your local comic book shops more Especially. than anything else. You can always do gift cards. Mm-hmm. Gift and cards are a good one as well. Directly spent your money, but, mm-hmm. you know, even if you couldn't necessarily get that particular thing yet, those are options. Also just wanted to revisit. Don't open suspicious links. Even if... It seems like it's somebody that you know. If this sounds like a weird or a great opportunity, double check sometimes the sender. Make sure that everything is correct. Maybe just reach out if it's somebody that you supposedly know. Reach out to them. Hey, did you send me a link? Or something like that. Dec- yeah, message them on a, whatever separate app. And don't that reply you can. to the email, please, guys. This use your brains <laughs> a little bit, but don't reply to that email. But another method of communication that is verified for this person: Did you send me a download, a file, a mm-hmm. link, something like that? Trust but verify kind of deal. Practice safe cyber yeah. existence. <laughs> Not saying just distrust everybody, but like just confirm if it's something that if could it seems be we- sus. do a gut check. Moving on, slightly related because ransomware attacks are mostly committed asking for ransom via crypto and NFTs are tangentially related to crypto. Did you see this story about this Philippine bookshop selling book chapters as NFTs? Very interesting. I did. You look terrified. I don't know how I feel about it, to be honest. <laughs> I, I read it, and then I read it again, and I'm, I'm still processing the mm-hmm. idea. Yeah. I don't know that I especially love it. I understand all of the linked facts of how they exist. I just kind of hate it. <laughs> so there is that. I'm neutral on NFTs. I mean, it's just another thing to buy slash sell. I don't have any moral stance on it. I know a lot of people get either evangelistic about it or that it's a, it's fine. I feel weird about the bookseller being the one to sell the NFTs of the book chapters and not the author. Yes. Yeah. So I, I guess like... they have to have purchased the rights to the book, mm-hmm. etc. So and that's yeah. Practically speaking, I'm hopeful that they are not underselling. And then separately, it's just this will be interesting to see later if it continues and the the model is picked up in a broader sense. If something blows up, what potential recompense does the author get? Because he only sold his book for, say, two grand or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the company is just raking it in or something. And and I don't even know if that's even possible because of the, the, the nature yeah, I don't know where this will go. This is, it felt like a little bit of a random thing. I'm happy that they've, you know, worked out the technology to do this. Obviously, progress in that way is always good. But I'm I'm interested to see what where they'll go with it. That that article is from B-World Online, if anyone also wants to check it out. I feel like we need to be, we're, we've been horrible about citing our sources. <laughs> we'll include the sources in the in links the show notes, yeah. and stuff whenever we post <laughs> So yeah, we'll see where it goes. I always like innovation in general. On principle, I think innovation is a good thing. Yes. And I'm happy that people are using this tool that is very genuinely interesting. And I hope that it goes somewhere good for the authors and the writers and the booksellers. I'm so neutral on this. I have nothing really interesting to say. I'll be less neutral for you. <laughs> good. Thank you. Don't like it. Fuck NFTs. <laughs> ah. No, it just feels weird. That's all. I got. I just doesn't. And I say this as somebody that works adjacent to the finance industry. It's a lot like the stock market. Everything's mm. made up and the money doesn't matter. That's it's right. Like, so anyway, the end. Our next story, this comes to us from Shelf Awareness, or this commentary comes to us from Shelf Awareness. There has been some drama in the American Booksellers Association, and this is probably worthy of its own main episode. The American Booksellers Association has decided that it will no longer support people who are publishing white supremacist views. Now, on the whole, personally, I think that's a good thing. There has been some drama surrounding it because white supremacists are a minority. ABA, the American Booksellers Association, was established to protect minority voices. Right now, those minority voices happen to be disagreed with. And is that not the principle of what they should be protecting? 
my limits on the whole we need to protect freedom of speech at all costs are really when you're advocating for violence and i think that white supremacy is inherently advocating for violence so i want to separate that argument out and just revisit the article i don't know that the aba per se is advocating sure they're actually just removing themselves from the equation they is are actually... they're stepping back yeah so what's yes. actually happening is the aba is stepping back from protecting people protecting minority voices and that was they're sort of farming they're directing mm-hmm. people out to different Yes. avenues that can do that for mm-hmm. them essentially and people within the organization have objected to that because it feels to them very much like they are picking a side so set having set that particular <laughs> item just yes. i just went to the side because it's yes and i and i do understand some inactivity is a stance mm-hmm. to take and it sometimes is picking one of the two sides it is not a third side mm-hmm. that said i just wanted to confirm and yes. clarify that it's not actively removing protections per se agreed it is yes just of removing course we should have from, that. yes yeah. it is removing itself from that protection yeah it's not as much of a gatekeeper there i agree i think that the uh, first amendment and anyone's rights should absolutely be protected and defended up until the point where they infringe upon another person's rights correct that's and that, or not correct but yes that is what i was saying yeah <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, I totally 100% agree with that. And I I understand that sometimes people like to lawyer and argue that it's a gray area. It's not. You're just an asshole. (laughs) I just want to be clear. Anything that advocates violence Mm -hmm. or cruelty, no. You, you're not protected under law. And I just want to circle back again. So this is a, a stance that this particular organization has taken, but they are not legally required to take because the First Amendment applies to the government, not to private organizations and industries. Yeah. So it is obviously a, a sensitive matter for the consumers and the consumers can speak with their dollars, but legally speaking... The ABA is doing nothing wrong. Maybe they could have taken a stronger stance, but I understand that they are trying to find a decent balance where they can still maybe step in and help minorities that aren't advocating for violence and they can direct those sources to to people that are better framed to assist. Yes. I imagine we'll be hearing more about this. This was not the first story. I I sent you the shelf awareness story on it, the commentary on it, because that was, I felt, the most measured and most comprehensive description of the situation. I imagine we haven't seen the last of this and we will probably be talking about it again soon. And maybe not just with this organization too. It's a pretty hot topic and it's a relevant discussion in general for Mm -hmm. a lot of industries. Yeah. Um, Moving on separately, this one was from Publishers Weekly. Spotify acquired an audiobook producer. I Mm -hmm. love audiobooks, especially for train trips or whatever. I I actually (laughs) speaking of flights and any traveling where you're doing where you might have spotty service or not access to a network. I think it's great. I think Mm -hmm. it's if you have long drives, I think they're awesome. Can't focus as well for podcasts, frankly, unless it's like a story, which is probably just me being mentally lazy. I don't know. (laughs) Um, But so the audiobooks are are really cool as far as it goes for trips and traveling for me. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. So you do better on audio with fiction than nonfiction. Absolutely. Interesting. Wow. In fairness, I've been forced to read fiction and nonfiction with my ears. I've never, I guess, sat and like thought to myself whether or not I liked it. (laughs) So if it's fully just for pleasure rather than me Uh trying to gain a specific piece of knowledge, way, way more engaged with fiction. And that's just across the board for me. I think we talked about it previously. I thoroughly enjoy well-crafted, engaging books, Mm -hmm. nonfiction books. If it's just well-crafted and put together and not dry, if the author is specifically engaged in their topic, then I won't even notice that it was written in 1812 for example <laughs> outside of of the occasional book like that i like, yeah you're a fiction girl yeah i i love audiobooks my libby app is fantastic we have a family subscription to audible we have all these things i'm really i listen to most of my podcasts on spotify so this will be a nice little change i feel like i read definitely or i consume a book faster on audio it's the opposite for you oh absolutely really oh Oh, yeah okay maybe i'm just weird no Um. no i don't think that's true at all i just think that that's part of my problem is that i feel partially slowed when i'm trying to get Uh. nonfiction because i just want to get it over with yeah and i can consume the knowledge faster even worse oh yeah oh that makes total sense it's rough anyway yeah yeah, please go i'm sorry no i i i mean i feel like i consume things faster when i'm listening to it and that's one of the reasons i like podcasts in general just because it's like a lot of information information and kind of a smaller it's how we learn it is it's our difference in learning yeah all right moving forward my personal favorite section women being badasses in publishing oh, yeah. 
So for those of you who have had experience with Wattpad, which Kaylee and I have not, we've talked about that maybe the first guest that we bring onto our show is what is Wattpad and how does it work? I have only really consumed Wattpad via other sites. It'll be a repost from Wattpad onto something else. But Wattpad is jumping into publishing and teaming up with Frayed Pages, Anna Todd's multimedia company. So they are teaming up to be Frayed Pages X Wattpad Books. I'm pretty excited for this. The first release will be, according to Publishers Weekly, a graphic adaptation of Todd's best-selling 2014 Pro series to be released in spring 2022. They're moving pretty fast. I know, yeah. We'll see how it goes. I always get very excited whenever we see a woman doing something in publishing, women being badass and launching their own imprints because they can. Yeah, they can. It's and very they're doing nice. great. Kind of, did you take a look at this? What did you think? I did. I think it's awesome. I, again, like I feel like an old fogey. I'm not especially up on the Wattpad and they're talking about like how <laughs> These Anna- in their what pad. <laughs> it's like about Anna as like their original author as influencer on that platform. And I was just like, I have no idea who this lady is. <laughs> I need to go get my walker uh, and my cane. My hearing aids. Yeah. <laughs> The kids on their Wattpads. We'll have to have someone help us and do a deep dive. Oh, yeah. So it's interesting. It's mm-hmm. just a different platform that I hadn't been part of. And I think it's fantastic that people are reading. I always mm-hmm. think it's fantastic that people yeah. are reading. It yeah, doesn't matter how or where they go to do it. Old things die. That's yeah. what they do. Like us. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Someday. Hopefully. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> I don't want to be immortal. We are, we are millennials and depressed for anyone who yeah. didn't pick up on that one. <laughs> well, guess I'll launch myself into the sun. Woo-hoo. We can always just have that meme now. Be nice and warm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So yeah, I just think that that's awesome. I think that it's great that she's got this opportunity that she was able mm-hmm. to leverage the experience uh-huh. of writing into having her multimedia company and then she's able to use her relationship with Wattpad in, in a, a beneficial way. We're going to find out that we're pronouncing it totally wrong. It'll be Worcestershire or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's it's Wattpad or Wattpad. We will have that as a full episode. Wattpad and derivations thereof. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Pronunciations thereof. <laughs> absolutely. Old, old fogies. Sorry, kids. Next up in our Women Being Badasses in Publishing, new James Bond coming! Oh, I'm so excited! That's awesome! I'm pretty pumped. I'm not, like, the biggest fan of mystery novels and, like, spy thrillers, mm. but, like, Oh, I am. I'm very excited. I love cool. them. Definitely one of my preferred genres. So Kim Sherwood partnering with HarperCollins. This came from Publishers Weekly. HarperCollins acquired the U.S., Canadian, and U.K. Commonwealth rights to the new thrillers by Kim Sherwood. A new raft of double O agents has been promised. Promised. So keep an eye out for that and uh, congrats to Kim Sherwood and all of the women in the world doing their best and doing awesome. Keep sparkling. Yeah, that's right. I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, just the general high level summary. That looks, I'm so interested. Yeah, I'm interested as well. And now for our favorite section, Kaylee, what are you reading? I am still reading uh, Lord of Star Ale. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm still in the process of that one. It's becoming a bit of a mystery, Ooh. speaking of. Mm. So we talked about last time how the main character was going to be chosen, of course. Of course, she's she the was, pro- she is the protagonist. But it was a lie. Somebody <gasps> stole the doohickey that chooses and Not they the replaced doohickey. it. And so there's a way to like recraft it or something. But oh, they can't okay. find so it. So she has it, to go on a quest to recraft it? They the whole there's like so there's a it's a mystery. So they that's like an option if they can't find it, they can't figure out what's happening. So I told you like the butler was one hundred percent a fairy. Of I mean, course. One of the many non related handsome men in her life. Obviously. Um and he is a fairy <laughs> prince who was on the run because his dad essentially wanted to have him killed Aww. for the purposes of stoking a war. Yeah. That, can I say I do and this is a trope in the truest sense of the word because it goes back to the Grimm's brothers of the prince on the run from their evil father and then being like listen I'm nice I just, why does everybody hate me I just didn't want to die I'm sorry yep yep <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. So, so yeah, so now the, the prince, the main character, the person who is likely the likeliest candidate that didn't get chosen at the fake ceremony ah, okay. are all like kind of seeking out information on this. So yeah, so we've got a, a mystery on our hands. And then Fun. also you've got this potential fairy invasion happening that's been hinted at from the prologue. Heck and fairies. So yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, I'm pretty interested and invested. We'll see yeah. Oh, so yeah. Fun. Keep us updated. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. What are you reading, Annie? I am reading a book called The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft, which I picked up because 
I think many of us went through this in the 90s. We had that new age phase and you're like, oh, I bet this crystal will help me and solve my problem. And spoilers, it doesn't. But there's something about like that genre. I have like good nostalgic feelings about it and I love learning about a crystal or whatever. So that was what I was looking for when I picked this book up. And that is not at all what this book is. (laughs) I have never read a more comprehensive and succinct discussion on cultural appropriation in any book ever or on the representation of witches as marginalized women in pop culture. It is very, very good and like not at all even I'm I'm more than halfway through the book and nary a crystal has been mentioned. <laughs> Other than, you know, to say, hey, some books will tell you to put this stuff in your water and oh. drink it and, and, and then don't do that because it's got lithium in it and that will kill you. So it was very, very interesting. Very, very good. Talking about the history of persecution and what the state of paganism today and how creating intentions feels intimidating sometimes. Going out of your comfort zone feels intimidating sometimes. Spiritual journeys are inherently complicated and taken up by many different people for many different reasons. So withholding judgment if you think something's weird, making sure to read up on things is always, always good. And I I genuinely was not expecting such a measured, mature look at witchcraft in the modern day. And that is what I got. And I'm very, very happy that I picked it up. I follow a few people through Tumblr, actually, but I just don't don't ask me how I got to them. I'm not really sure. And so there's... I bet it's a secret. (laughs) There's a wacky, like, element to their blog, but they also have... They're a pretty serious researcher into just occult practices, witchcraft, and general paganism, and just historically as well as just practices... And there's a, a really big issue with cultural appropriation, for sure. Huge. And it's just like more so even it feels like than a lot of other sources because it's about religion. And that's just some bullshit, guys. Like, it's another person's religion. Like, you should be at least mildly respectful. Yeah. So that sounds like a really cool book and one of the few, like, nonfiction pieces I'd probably really enjoy reading. Very, so and he's a up. very, very good writer. He's very funny. And he talks about growing up as a gay man and how... He he experienced this kind of thing firsthand with people appropriating drag culture. And so he comes at it from a very sympathetic view. And he's like, and here is a, you know, three question test to figure out if what you're doing is appropriation. And I was like, whoo, this is nice. <laughs> I love Helpful. it when it's at least a, the start the start initial gatekeeping is fairly straightforward because mm-hmm. if, if you can't get past that one, you shouldn't go on to the more complex. Yeah, exactly. Like you should just drop it. It is super, super interesting. And he has a podcast, which I will be checking out after I finish this book. So highly recommend that one. It is very good. The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft. The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft. And it is a very pretty book. If you are someone who likes having physical books, I recommend it on your bookshelf. It's very pretty. Uh, we are going to take a quick break and then we are going to be right back with our main segment today we are talking about own voices and i'm really excited to have this conversation with you kaylee because i feel like we are coming at it from totally different directions (laughs) all right we will be right back And we are back, and our big topic for the week is own voices. Kaylee, I know this is is one of those really conceptual definitions, but do you want to get us started and tell us what it is and what the conversations about it are? Absolutely. So own voices as a movement was started in 2015 by a female author who wanted to use it as a method of bringing to light the issue in writing and publishing where stories about minorities are not being told by the minorities. But generally speaking, it's been a conversation for a very long time. So nobody can argue, I think, and nobody should. In fact, if you can, don't. Don't argue. (laughs) That minorities shouldn't be allowed to tell their story. (laughs) Like, I cannot express enough. They absolutely should, yes. Like, we should support minorities and and broadcast their voices for these stories. A hundred percent. Annie, what dig, do you think? Let's dig deeper into that, I think, because it's it's such a specific conversation. So what are you seeing that is happening, actually happening, and then the response to it? So I definitely have approached this from not the 
publishing like sure. it's more of a self publishing as a consumer free, you've yeah and, and just in general like through fan fiction and yep. through short fiction that is published through different platforms like mm-hmm. tumblr or archive of our own blogging platforms journaling yep. stuff like that and and I, so i guess i'm approaching it more from just the people that are engaging in these arguments yeah, directly yeah, yeah. as opposed mm-hmm. to companies that are approaching this as a discussion and i've seen i've seen people say you can't have you can have black characters in your book you can only have white characters in your book because you're not black and first off you don't know if you're speaking from the internet you don't know you assume like a shit ton about the people that you're working with which you can't you literally unless you personally know that this person is an exploitative asshole in real life like you don't know if what their what their racial background is they could look pale skinned and still have a black mom or dad that was something that i remember what i think it was a movie that was written by someone who was not out yet and they received a lot of criticism for not being part of the queer community but you don't it was know. like a it was like a it was like a shadow outing of them which is is, is terrible he going after someone for something that you cannot confirm or deny. It's ridiculous. And then also, even if they're not of that particular minority, who are you to say that somebody can't reach out to that minority, do the research? Like, who are you to gatekeep another person, like another group? Or like, what if somebody in your community wants to tell their story and wants to work with this person? Like, where yeah. does your ability to say no stop and their ability to say yes begin? Like, so it's such a complicated thing. If you're not approaching it thoughtfully and critically reviewing doing your stance on this topic, then I don't, I'm very concerned about that approach. I am concerned and, about that as And those well. passionate people that just don't actually use their brains. Mm-hmm. Critical thinking is really important, fam. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, we see this online all the time. The the bad parts of cancel culture, like piling on for no real reason, just because someone said something about something and then it got retweeted, but it wasn't actually the thing that anyone actually said. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. We should approach this with some consideration and thought and Obviously, having own voices work is extremely important, but we are not here to cancel anyone or be part of the problem of more anger and hatred in the world for no real reason. And reduce diversity, because that's actually what will that end up what, happening. That is what does end up happening, is reducing diversity. So we've talked about this on the podcast, and we saw this with the Chuck Tingle Hugo Award situation, where these trolls were like, sci-fi is too diverse now. So let's nominate Chuck Tingle, who presents as a white man, the, as a as a trolling act, and we've I've talked about this before. Like sci-fi is not real. <laughs> there's no there's no, there isn't even really as much of an own voices conversation in sci-fi. But we still get that backlash. We still get people rejecting diversity because they feel that it is all encompassing, and that's not at all what anyone is saying. If you feel defensive, if you feel threatened by a person of color in your space, imagine how they feel being rejected from every single space they've been walking into with you in it. If you feel like that that there is going to be some kind of violence just because of someone's skin color, that is a prejudice. That is a bias that you have. And I highly recommend analyzing that bias and... Talking to someone maybe? Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps talking to someone about that, reaching out and figuring out what where that bias comes from. And it is possible that maybe you have been subjected to violence, but perhaps blaming that on an entire race of people or an entire group of people is not fair or valid. Own voices, um, when people talk about own voices, most of the time what they're talking about are racially diverse. And we are going to be focusing on the American market just because that's what we're most familiar with and those are the conversations we've been following. So usually they mean black or brown voices or Asian and Pacific Islander voices or LGBTQ voices writing about characters that also share those characteristics. So black people writing about black people, queer people writing about queer people. And again, we've said this before, we use queer just as a, a shorthand for LGBTQ. LGBTQ+, because it's a lot more syllables to say LGBTQ+. We do not mean any offense by using the queer word, and I am not a member of the queer community, but... Well, I am, and I support the (laughs) word queer, so... (laughs) I I do, and I... Because, I mean, nobody else needs to get into the the, the massive amounts of, of discussion. There's a lot and... going on on queer. Anyway. Anyway. So that's why we use queer. Um, we are happy to make a whole episode about it, but that's not quite this one. So making these stories, even if it's fiction, even if it's fantastical sci-fi written by the people who identify with that, it's very different. There is no 
data out there, unfortunately, on the racial or gender identification or orientation of protagonists. But I was able to break down the U.S. population is about 60% white, 12% Latino or Latina, 12% African American, 5% Asian American and Pacific Islander, and 1% American Native. And I looked at the current New York Times bestseller list, and it is about 90% white and 90% male. So I mean, not even digging any deeper from that. Like you can see that there is a gap between the people of America who are presumably consuming books, even if we're just looking at demographics, and the people who are writing and publishing books. So the need for own voices, it feels completely intuitive. Authentic, for sure. I, you don't even need me to start spouting off data. And that's why we highlight these niche imprints and publishing companies that are, are mm -hmm. coming into fruition right now yeah. and ways that can uh, more respectfully and sustainably reach out to these communities and publish their works because it hasn't traditionally been available. Because a neat, kishy hashtag doesn't necessarily do anything. The actual work that is going behind the concept of own voices definitely 100% needs to happen. And it needs to Absolutely. happen in the industry. Yeah. It needs to happen in like who who, who reviews the pitches mm -hmm. who approves things forward all the gatekeepers mm -hmm. that's where we need to actually focus on bringing in the diversity and it is a lot of work and it, this isn't any kind of silver bullet i don't want to make it sound like own voices is the cure for all the problems all the diversity problems in publishing own voices you can tell from the phrase own voices they're really just talking about authors there's tons of room for illustrators editors marketers who are marketing these own voices books who are not diverse either or who, who aren't in part of diverse communities either so we're going to be talking about authors specifically throughout this and own voices works being usually prose poetry that kind of thing written by people of those diverse backgrounds so this i don't want to call it a backlash but this movement I mean, it goes back forever. There was backlash against Uncle Tom's Cabin, which for those of you who are not in the US or who don't know, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a, a slave narrative story that was written by a white woman. A lot of people felt a lot of connection to that book and I don't want to downplay the fact that that fiction was able to work in a way that perhaps a lot of nonfiction at the time was not working. There are a lot of people who draw a line directly from Uncle Tom's Cabin publishing to the Civil War and freeing of the slaves. And again, don't want to downplay that, but the honest truth is that this was a white woman writing about black people in a situation that she literally could not fully conceive of. And there's not a lot of evidence to really speak to the wide breadth of, say, research that mm -hmm. she, that may, she may or done. may or not have done. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. slaves did not have the opportunity to write and publish novels. And so it's, it's so difficult. But even back to that time, people have said, can she really accurately write about this life, this story, when she has never been a part of it? And that obviously continues through to today for those of you who weren't paying attention to the publishing industry in the past few years. American Dirt, it's a fascinating story that really highlights this. If you want to Google that one, it's um, obviously there's, there's more commentary on that than the Uncle mm -hmm. Tom. But I think that it, it makes intuitive sense, like I said before, that we do need diverse voices yes. out there. Just speaking about Uncle Tom, since we already are, mm -hmm. it was able to convey something to people of specifically the north of the U.S. who were against slavery, specifically the abolitionists, something that they could not convey through nonfiction, through a different kind of storytelling. So I think that it's it's so important for stories to be told and intuitively understand that these stories should be told. But the contention of the own voices movement is that they should be told by the people who are living them. They should actively be engaged in the process. And or, I fully yes, agree. Like, absolutely. And they should be, when they want to create, they should be encouraged to create. Yes. And if they don't want to create, but the story needs to be told, then they should be engaged at every step of that process. Absolutely. And that's a good point too. We're talking about writing and also credit. So if they're, even if they're not the ones putting pen to paper it's figuratively, it is still their story and they should be involved in that process. White people in America have a literal history of profiting off of black bodies and ideas, and that cannot continue in the way that it has up to now. I don't think that there are a lot of people out there who think that the own voices movement is wrong. I think that there's a lot of people arguing about the details, yes. which on its own is kind of, you know, heartening that we're like, okay, this does need to happen. And we're just like arguing about the methods. Mm -hmm. So let's chat about the methods. 
So studies show that children who see themselves represented in media are overall happier and overall have better self-esteem. And I could go into all of the studies that show that children having higher self-esteem are better citizens, better people, better parents, better spouses, better Mm -hmm. human beings out existing out in the world. So the benefits are there. And a lot of times this really comes up in children's literature and children's publishing. This was a stat that was brought up by a classmate of mine and it blew my mind. So of course, it's not crazy that 60% or so of protagonists in children's literature are white. Humans in the United States, 60% of them are white. Like it's not, I don't think that that is as out of bounds as it could be, but the next highest percentage is not any people of color. It is in fact animals. It's white people and animals animals. And I feel like that fact on its own is insane in its implications. It's very concerning. And I think that it's separately concerning because in a lot of places, authors are stepping out back from from the racial conversations by making all of their characters animals, right. which has its own deeply unfortunate implications. Yes. Again, for, the, for those who may not know, or if you've just been sheltered, Um, The white supremacist movement in this country has a history of equating people of color with various animals. We don't need to go all the way into that, but it's 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 very problematic on its own. Google's trends, actually, you said this, this was started in 2015. Um, it really gained traction in 2016. The Google Trends data takes a huge jump in 2016. There's probably a lot of reasons for that. I think the political situation in America had something to do with it. There was a, another large jump in 2020. I think that, again, the racial situation happening in the headlines had something to do with that. So I think that that actually shows that people do realize that this is something directly related to current events, that this is something that is a proactive step that can be taken towards perhaps fixing some of these problems that we have that are systemic. It has to be done from every avenue of Mm -hmm. society. It really has to be rooted out, for sure. And this is something that I didn't really think about very deeply until I started looking at some of this, like just the fact that we have special sections of our podcast devoted to women and minority voices is very telling that these are not the majority, that these are... We find these because they're unique pieces that people have to write about. Exactly. They are different. (laughs) Most imprints out there, for those of you who are just new to publishing, most imprints focus on genre or story style. They don't focus on the human beings writing the stories or the the, the characters themselves. So this is, it's, it's news. It is not common. We talk about it because we have to. And that was one of the main points of us starting this podcast was making sure that there was at least a little bit of a platform that maybe they weren't getting elsewhere because they are so rare. So obviously, mm-hmm. again, we aren't subtle. We, <laughs> we, our, our we opinions are, we on are. this, our opinions on this are pretty clear. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, and we do obviously hope this, hope to see more of this in the future. I had an honorable mention that I wanted to bring up in Gideon the Ninth. Um, the author, Tamison Muir, which I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, I apologize, does identify as a lesbian. And there are many characters in that book who don't actually say their sexuality. But this was something that I came across when I was writing my review of the book and posting it. I, I look at other people's reviews and someone was like, oh, they said this was a queer book, but there's very little queer stuff in it. I mean, I guess people are, you know, in love with each other, but it doesn't seem like that's the center of the story. And I'm like, it's no, that's the point. <laughs> that it shouldn't be. just live their they lives. They do. They just live their life. They sit on couches sometimes and they don't have to do it queerly. Like they don't, (laughs) they don't just walk around thinking about how gay they are. Like that's not a thing, (laughs) you know? And, and yeah, like there's this, this woman who has, um, you know, several romantic or semi-romantic relationships in this book. And it never, the word lesbian, the word queer, the idea that it is abnormal never comes up. It's just a thing. It's just her feelings. And I felt like that was the point. And I think that that is what you get when you get own voices. It is human beings being human beings. The, you know, marginalizedness of their identity is not the biggest piece of their identity. The biggest it's, piece is that they are a person. Mm-hmm. And they, they, sh- they, oh, that's, yes, it's so stupid. Like, mm-hmm. queer characters should be in every genre and every type of book and marginalized and minority characters should, should be everywhere because they exist. Mm-hmm. And they can exist uh, shooting space lasers and they can exist <laughs> on pirate ships and 
They can be by, uh, people in government. It doesn't. They could be spies. They could be assholes. They could. They be, could be villains. Yeah. They could every. Like, Their identity doesn't need to revolve around that. The fact that they're just constantly like thinking about like how queer they are, like you said. <laughs> yeah. No like, one. There's not a. There's not a <laughs> no wrong way to. That. Anyway. Everyone has other things that make them yes. that make up the the whole of your person. Like mm-hmm. That is, if that's who your queer character is, you're being exploitative. Talk to people in that community because they are not. I guarantee, always thinking about whatever makes them marginalized. They've got lives and dreams and hopes. They do a whole bunch of shit. So that needs to be brought forward in a thoughtful manner into your writing. And we need to support those creators when they want to create that content to let them tell that story and to tell to let them write these like fictional books where it's part of it but it's not the whole part of it i got space lasers to shoot so what if i'm a lesbian you know yeah that's not the point of this story but i'm allowed to be a lesbian and shoot space lasers and wield a sword yeah fuck, fuck anybody who says different okay. i'm mad i'm mad now because people are stupid um <laughs> i've gotten kaylee all fired up ah! i thought i was gonna be the fired up one today <laughs> You got me. <laughs> got me. Don't be an asshole. I feel like that's a lot of my, what mine boil down to. But, Those are um, your parting thoughts. Yeah, don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Thanks for listening. This is The Inkling. I'm Annie. And I'm Kelly. <laughs>